How's it going folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Ending Explain, we're looking at the found footage thriller Creep, following a young videographer that answers an online ad for a job in a remote town to record the messages of a dying man. When he notices the man's odd behavior, he starts to question his intentions. I really like this one as it manages to do a lot with very little. It's pretty much just two dudes talking, but impressively thanks in no small part to the multi-layered performance of Mark Duplass, this one is a delightful oddball found footage tale. Duplass and his brother Jay are generally regarded as ushering in the subgenre known as mumblecore with their feature debut, The Puffy Chair. The style known for its naturalism in both performance and dialogue, as well as predominantly being improvised, which then spawned its own subgenre, mumble gore, featuring the same naturalistic approach, but combining that with horror elements, of which Creep might be the most successful overall. As it's mostly dialogue, they toe this line constantly of things being weird, funny, and creepy, appropriate, and also an undercurrent of scary that works really well. And this was actually a lot funnier than I remembered, but funny in a very peculiar and even unsettling way, which is an impressive feat that again makes this one a standout as a classic for these reasons, and also makes very good use of the found footage style to glean many scares as well. It's simple, effective, and downright memorable considering its minuscule budget. And it's no surprise that this comes from Blumhouse. Where would we be without those guys. There is a lot to dissect with the creep character and what his whole deal is, so we'll be focusing on who he says he is versus who he actually is, the truth lying somewhere in between, along with explaining the ending that gives us further context to the creep's personality and sets things up nicely for our story to continue in Creep 2. We meet our constantly filming videographer Aaron on his way out into the mountains for a filming job. A thousand bucks a day, discretion appreciated, is all the listing said. And he admits that he doesn't even know the guy, longingly considering it could be some beautiful lonely woman waiting for him, writing it off as just a thought. Yeah, not exactly, but Ascending into the heavily forested area, he arrives at the remote house, having to climb a large set of stairs already winded by the time he reaches the door. There's no answer when he knocks or uses the little buzzer thing, and no response when he tries to call either. Seeing an axe ominously sticking out of a tree stump below, he opts to wait in his car, assuming the guy isn't going to show. Just then, he appears at the car window, startling Aaron, introducing himself as Joseph, smiling creepily, saying they're gonna have a great time today, telling him he has a kind face, opening the door to lure him out. Joseph asks for a hug to break the ice, asking him to trust him, promising that this won't be weird at all. Uh, it's already weird. He calls the cabin his family's vacation home, reminiscing that there's many memories in these walls, and Joseph is anxious to get started with his video project. As he divulges to Aaron. He used to have cancer and quickly beat it into remission with chemo, but two months ago started getting dizzy spells, having cognitive misfirings, and learned that he had a huge brain tumor. Being inoperable, he only has two months to live. However, he's still hopeful that he can beat it with the power of positive thinking. Okay. And in case he doesn't, reveals he's married and his wife is pregnant with their first child called Buddy, intending to record a series of video messages for his unborn son to remember him after his passing, a la the 90s Michael Keaton melodrama, My Life. He hands over the cash up front, calling their arrangement no longer a business transaction, but a partnership and journey into art telling Aaron they're going to do great stuff. Clearly excited, going for a high five. If things didn't already seem a bit off here, Joseph's first thing that he asks Aaron is to follow him into the bathroom, settling in for a nice bath. Or as he recalls with his father when he was a child, tubby times! And since he might not have tubbies with his own son, does so now, miming an invisible baby with stinky toes, which is totally bizarre and hilarious. Though things turn somber after a soak. Disappointed, thinking of his limited time left, either being in pain or sad, wanting things to be happy, and considers that he could just end things right now, and slinks under the water, appearing to try and drown himself. Aaron freaks, and Joseph emerges, laughing it off as just a joke. Wanting to take him somewhere, they need some coats first, sending Aaron down to a closet. When pulling away a curtain, he's frightened by a weird wolf mask on the shelf. But Joseph explains it's just Peach Fuzz, the friendly wolf that his dad created for him, with a theme song and everything to boot. Joseph puts on the masks and sings the song for him, 
submit a nice little performance there. Their destination is some kind of supposedly magical healing spring that only the pure of heart can utilize. Excitedly running into the woods to his son, let's go cure some cancer. I guess thinking that this spring will cure him. They stop when Joseph says he heard something in the woods and randomly just straight up bolts off, leaving Aaron yelling after him in confusion. He does track him down, Joseph popping up to scare him again. Just another prank. But this time he turns the camera on Aaron to get his reaction, calling what he witnessed an incredible near-death experience. As for a brief moment, he could see on Aaron's face that he thought his life was in danger, and Joseph could see in his eyes a split second where he wanted to kill him, feeling that there is an animal somewhere inside of Aaron. Joseph asks about the axe in front of the house, and if he thought that he might kill him with it. Aaron admits that he did, which he finds funny. It seems that they've been walking for quite a while, Joseph promising they're on the right path, coming across a sign, but it's just for a sewage water system. Aaron, growing uncomfortable, asks if he knows the way back since they took so many different paths. Joseph saying it doesn't matter, they need to keep going forward. You can't find a miracle with ropes attached to us, and runs off again. Discovering a lookout point, he has something to show the doubtful Aaron down below. What looks like a heart-shaped formation in the rocks. Exactly what they were looking for. Maybe he's not so crazy after all. Both climb down into the water, cleaning and purifying themselves in the supposedly magic waters. Joseph carving in their initials in a rock with a heart around it, and offers to take him to a place in town for some pancakes. Almost like they are really bonding and starting to actually become friends here. At the restaurant, Joseph again turns the attention to the man behind the camera, asking Aaron if there's anything he's ever really been ashamed of in his life. Him divulging a story from when he was a kid, and had a monitor on him that detected wetness. When playing on the monkey bars, he needed to take a whiz, but didn't want to stop playing, and ended up pissing his pants setting off the monitor, leaving him lying on the ground depressed with piss all over him and an alarm loudly beeping. Yeah, that's pretty embarrassing stuff. Joseph tells him he appreciates him sharing that, and asks for a turn himself, revealing that he was watching and took pictures of Aaron when he first arrived at the house, excusing that he was nervous and wanted to get to know him before he got to know him that it might make him less scared. He apologizes, and even though that is definitely unsettling and weird, Aaron plays along that it's fine and agrees to move past it. How much can you put up with Aaron? That seems to kind of be the question here. Regardless, when they make it back to the house that night, Aaron is ready to call it a day. Joseph is a little taken aback as he was going to pour him a whiskey to commemorate their great day together. And after some more prodding, Aaron relents to having one drink. Joseph asks why he took the job in the first place for the money, he admits, then asking if he has money problems, telling him it's nothing to be ashamed of, and reveals that it took him some time to accumulate his own wealth. After thinking, Joseph wants to give Aaron some money, him turning uncomfortable and turning down his gracious offer. So Joseph tries a different tactic. If Aaron had an excess of food, wouldn't he share it with him? Well, yes, Aaron agrees. Joseph considers it the same thing. He has an excess of money, and Aaron needs it, so what's the problem? He's still unsure, but he tells him to check his boot, as there's already a check in there, which he immediately looks down at, but it's another joke. But as Joseph said, since he looked, that means he must need the money, offering to help them figure it out. And toast to us. After a single sip, Aaron is like, I'm out, going to grab his coat. Joseph confused, asking why he's leaving, and blurts out that he lied to him, asking about what? Peach fuzz, he says. He tells him it's something he can't tell another living soul and needs to get it off his chest before dying, asking him to sit down and turn the camera off, still hearing their audio over a black screen. He proceeds to tell quite a story involving the internet and his wife's concerning browsing habits. When his internet started to slow down, a coworker suggested that it might be due to the browser history being full, and when he looked for himself, saw unspeakable things, mostly bestiality porn, and with only two people in the house, it must have been his wife, Angela, responsible. When confronting her, she outright denied it. And over time, the lie began to tear apart their marriage. So he took matters into his own hands, asking her to come up to the cabin, but left due to being called for work. He wasn't really called for work, though. Going down to a store and buying a wolf mask, coming back to the house three hours later. He climbed through the window while his wife was asleep and had ravenous, animalistic intercourse with her, saying he had never seen her so happy and escaped out the window. This is ridiculous. He came back the next morning as himself asking about her night, her only offering that it was fine with a little smirk, and they never spoke of it again. But the internet was back up to speed, as her desires had been fulfilled. Woo-wee, that is pretty messed up for sure. But hey, so what if it's a little kinky? It saved their marriage, right? Uh, no. 
still weird. Naturally, Aaron is only becoming more alarmed with each passing moment they're spending together as they return to filming Joseph's outro for the video. And after one take, Aaron's like, yeah, that was great, gotta go, searching for his keys, while Joseph, on the other hand, wasn't feeling it, asking for another take. Obviously shaken, Joseph is concerned his story scared him and offers that he should just stay the night. There's plenty of beds here and they'll find his keys in the morning and somehow does convince him to stay. Not that he can go anywhere without his keys anyway. And Joseph rubs his arm, apologizing for raising his voice. Aaron seems calmer now, pouring them another drink, both agreeing it was the right move for him to stay the night. And both chug their drinks down, Joseph with a much larger one. They try to do more takes and Joseph is really feeling it, thinking the drink tasted odd. Clearly, Aaron drugged him. Joseph's speech getting slurry as he does more takes. And later, he's passed out snoring, mumbling why did he do that, lulling him back to sleep to search his pockets for his keys, being careful not to disturb his slumber. Finding his cell phone, it starts to ring, rushing into the bathroom to answer where he learns the truth about his new friend. Thinking that it must be Angela, the woman asks to speak to Joseph, and he tries to explain that he's here to film her husband's cancer thing. She doesn't speak to this, but tells him he's gotta get out of there now. He asks if he's in danger, her saying her brother has problems, getting serious that he needs to leave immediately. Wow, so obviously Joseph has been lying about literally everything up to this point, and now we know for sure that he has more nefarious intentions here than he initially let on. When he returns to the living room, Joseph has vanished to Aaron's horror, searching the house for what he now knows is his dangerous new friend. He spots the back door slightly open, cautiously stepping outside, darting his view around the darkness. Joseph appears, exclaiming, death is coming, staring blank-eyed, and just keeps kinda creepily standing there for a few moments. Nothing we can do now, he oddly continues, then starting to get upset and breaks down sobbing, crying that he doesn't want to die and going in for a hug, telling Aaron he loves him and is a good friend. Ooh boy, yeah, this guy's got some major problems. Aaron tells him that he knows what's really going on here, that he's troubled, and offers to help, promising that he's not angry. All he wants is his keys and then they can go from there. Joseph keeps staring off, then frantically runs back inside and downstairs. Aaron follows after, encountering Joseph in his peach fuzz mask blocking the door. He asks, if he's going to let him go, him shaking his head no, then asks why he's doing this, just to scare him, him nodding in response. Aaron is all, okay, you win, I'm terrified, dude, asking him to step aside and let him go. Joseph starts growling and rubbing the door, rushing the camera, which cuts to static. Without knowing exactly what happened, we come back to footage of Joseph dragging some garbage bags and starting to dig a hole, assuming it's a chopped up Aaron inside, but pull away, seeing that Aaron did manage to escape, thinking this was all over over until a few days later, this footage on a disc was sent to him in the mail, meaning that Joseph knows his address, but decides to pretend it didn't happen, filing the disc away. But it turns out it's not so easy to forget after all. Aaron waking up from having bizarre nightmares of him and Joseph in a hot tub, Joseph wearing his peach fuzz mask and Aaron wearing his own baby wolf mask, realizing that he's giving him a tubby, feeling something weird in the water, he pulls out his hand, finding it covered in blood, groaning, he's really gotta forget about this guy. The next day, finding a huge box marked fragile on his doorstep with no return address, he's pretty sure he knows where it came from. Kicking and banging on the box before opening, inside he finds a kitchen knife and another disc. On it, Joseph is at a lake, apologizing for the previous grave digging video, calling it manipulative and an emotional response, excusing himself as he wasn't in the right headspace, as Aaron did drug him and all, having found the empty Benadryl bottle, which he's actually impressed by, deeming it a cool move and just wants to clear the air, he says, and reveals that if he hadn't found the third item in the box to pause the disc and dig deeper. There, Aaron finds a baby wolf stuffed animal, which weirdly mirrors his nightmare. And Joseph goes on to explain that he loves wolves because they love deeply, but don't know how to express it, generally doing so in violent ways, but deep down inside that they have a good heart, even if they are misguided and murderous, all plainly referring to himself and his broken mental state. The stuffed animal reminded Joseph of that that first moment in the woods where he scared him and saw that murderous glint in Aaron's eyes, encouraging him to embrace his own inner wolf, to take the knife and murder it, proclaiming when you get inside, all this beautiful stuff comes out. Almost like he's trying to groom Aaron to becoming a killer like him. Aaron doesn't use the knife instead, opting for his hands to rip the wolf open, retrieving a silver heart locket. Inside, it's pictures of the two of them, J and A forever inscribed, moaning, oh my God, in anguish at the strange gift, the disc ending with an ominous, see you soon, buddy. Obviously terrified, Aaron reinforces the locks in his house and tries to report him to the police, but with no real name or address to use as he learned that house
house was rented, there's not much that they can do to his frustration. Sarcastically saying, oh, I'll certainly be sleeping soundly tonight. Thanks a lot, lady. That night he's awoken by another similar nightmare, this time turning very real. When hearing a bang behind him, he flips his shit and turns on all the lights in the house, grabbing the knife and asking if anyone is there. Not noticing Joseph standing right at his front door when he leaves the room, quickly ducking out of sight when he returns. Hearing more sounds from outside, Aaron grabs the camera, drawn into a dark back alley, discovering only a knocked over trash can, moaning about raccoons, and not knowing just how close Joseph was. This becomes abundantly clear later when back in bed asleep, the camera flips on thanks to Joseph, and he cuts off a lock of his hair, Aaron having no idea of this violation until the next morning, discovering the screen on his window broken and a disc left behind labeled my last video. Here Joseph seems regretful and genuine, but at this point there's no reason to trust anything he says and is upset in particular for him throwing his special best pal locket in the trash, feeling his heart broken, and admits that this sent him into a spiral of bad and negative thoughts about Aaron, but ultimately felt that he was right to throw it away because they were never truly friends at all, since he did make up every single story about himself he told in their time together. He divulges that he wants to be honest, and if true, this moment does help us understand Joseph a bit more in his history, lamenting that he doesn't know what's wrong with him, but feels that he's been pretending his whole life. Initially, he was told to be an actor, but didn't like that because it wasn't real, and could only get off if it was real, illuminating the reason for his whole character show here tonight and lying about everything to Aaron, continuing that some doctors found him crazy and others didn't. Meds, whatever, none of it really helped, leading to him becoming distant and burning every bridge in his life. Now all he really wants is someone to talk to, asking for a second chance to meet Aaron to explain himself, offering that he'll be here at Lake Gregory tomorrow at 11 a.m., panning around, showing it's a wide open public space. No way he can hurt you, bud. Going even further emotionally, saying who he really is is a lonely person that just needs a friend. Ah, poor Joseph. The obvious sociopath and nutball just needs a friend. While it admittedly does sound very convincing, this guy is good. And poor naive and actually decent human being to a fault, Aaron decides to meet him the next day. But he ain't no fool, taping the meetup from his car and keeping his phone on the ready speed dial to 911. Good thinking, dude. He takes a seat on the park bench, looking out to the scenic view, eventually joined unknowingly by Joseph in a trench coat, walking right up behind him and staring, incredibly never turning around. Joseph pulls out his peach fuzz mask and axe, lifting them up and smacks it down right into the middle of Aaron's skull, turning once more to his still frame, this time watched by Joseph later. He's impressed by his safety plans, but he too wonders why he never turned to look behind him. He then understands why, calling Aaron the greatest man to ever live. No matter what he did to him in their weird day, he always always went along with it, and continued believing that Joseph truly didn't intend to harm him, and for the first time actually seems to be real with us, giving Aaron the honor of loving him the most the favorite of all of his victims. Getting obvious pleasure, he continues the footage murdering Aaron and gets startled by himself rushing the camera. We see that Joseph continues his murderous adventures after this and get a peek at his full catalog, already getting a call from another new victim, Bill, about a job, telling him he's looking forward to meeting him. He opens a cabinet full of tapes and discs, one movie for each of his previous murders, and each time must have subjected them to the same video cat and mouse setup we saw with Aaron. Certainly this whole act is how he gets his thrills. He kept pushing Aaron further and further as the day went on, almost like trying to get him to reach a breaking point and leave, but after a while it became obvious that Aaron is simply too nice to ever actually doubt Joseph, which of course proves to be his fatal downfall in the end. It does seem that Joseph really did value their friendship in an obviously twisted way and was being truthful at points about this, but ultimately everything to Joseph is just an act, acting for real as he said, doing this whole elaborate setup to get his rocks off. There's also something to Joseph that he's actually creating movies with his victims, a kind of art in his own mind. As he tells Aaron in the beginning, this is going to be an artistic journey, just not in the way that he would have ever imagined it. That wraps it up for this ending explained for Creep, but that isn't the end of our Killer Creeps adventures, as a few years later they followed this up with Creep 2, which is a kind of very creative subversion of the format of this film, finding our character in a very different place than presented here. It allows us to get a much deeper insight into who he really is is underneath the act. So yes, I will be taking a look at the sequel coming soon. But before we go, don't forget you can send me suggestions for any movies or TV shows you like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. Oh, excuse me, I uh, need to take this, sorry. Uh, yes, hello? Yeah, I was calling about the job. 
$1,000 a day. Discretion appreciated. Excellent. I will see you soon. Thank you so much. Looks like I got work to do. He's friends, he's my best friend. Mm -mm -mm. What did you guys think of Creep and its ending? What's your favorite found footage horror film? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.